Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back to the stage, David A. Steinberg. I often forget how important Mike is, only because he and I are such good friends. And generally, when we're together, he spends the vast majority of his time teasing me about something. But the other day, I was on Instagram, which Mike would chastise me for in the first place. But I was on Instagram, and a video popped up about Mike Milken. And literally, this video talked about how Mike had changed the entire financing world, went on to become one of the world's most important philanthropists, and is truly, when people ask me who is the smartest person I know, I always say there are two people. One is Mike Milken, and two is Bill Clinton, and it's probably in that order. So when you sit down with Mike, which I'm about to do, we were on a Zoom the other day talking about what we were going to chat about. And with Mike, a lot of what we talk about is dependent on his mood in that moment. So in that moment, Mike was on a massive kick about the global shift in population change and how that is going to affect business. Literally, over the next 25 years, we're going to see shifts in global population change. We're going to see the US, which has primarily been made up of people of European descent, shifting to the descent of other places. And we're going to see demographics in this country and the world change radically over the next years. First, Mike, welcome. Thank you for being here. Well, it's great. You know, when, when I heard they were introducing David A. Steinberg instead of Steinberg, I'm going to try to be at the top of my game here, David. Well, Mike, as you know, Steinberg is like Smith for Jews. So if I don't put the A, I get bunched in with a, a lot of other David Steinbergs. They've now started teasing me. They put in a presentation the other day, David A.I. Steinberg. And I missed it. Like, I didn't see it, and they just went through the whole presentation. Well, but that's what I thought the A stood for, David. You were well ahead of your time. Well, you know, we, as you know, a lot of people have been talking about AI for seven to 10 months. I've been talking about it with you for seven to 10 years. But when you think about global population shifts and the declining population across the world, let's first give a bit of an overview to the audience about what that looks like in your from your lens? I think the overriding view, David, is to really have two factors. One, betting on technology and what it's been able to do. And if you said to me, what was the hardest industry I ever had to finance? It was the mobile phone business. People didn't believe in it. And so when we think you could have got New York City and applied the application, $10,000 for us. And so data storage, one billionth of the cost early in my career, uh, the ability to have eight or nine billion phones on the planet. And so betting on technology, most of the most valuable for-profit companies in the world have bet on this interconnectivity and technology. The second area I would say as I reflect on the last 50 or 60 years is that people are focused on what was or what is for the most part, not where we're going. And so the demographic changes. The number of children born in China has dropped by 60%, Mike, even what... though the population has increased dramatically. And I don't think people fully reflect these dramatic changes as education levels of women have increased, as wealth has increased, and health benefits have increased, uh, the number of children being born in a more developed part of the world is dropping. And so I don't think people have fully realized who your customer might be next year, the year after, et cetera, and reflected on. And that was really the basis for our conversation the other day. And Michael, the, the, the numbers around China that you gave to me on where the population is today versus where you think it goes over the next 20, 50, 100 years, what do you think happens there from a numbers perspective? 
Well, unless they can find a way to substantially increase their birth rate, and there are programs in China today trying to get people to have three children, uh, there are 200 million more children in India than China today. And for every child born in China, there were two and a half children born in India. So people look at India or China in many ways, similar, similar developments, but demographically, they're totally different. And Nigeria today, as we've discussed, just one country in Africa, and 20 of the 21 countries in the world with the highest birth rate today are all in sub-Saharan Africa. But there are one in 125 children born in Nigeria for every child born in Western or Eastern Europe, from Ireland to Russia. And for every child born in Latin America, 100, there's 125 born in Nigeria. And for every child born in the United States, every 100 kids in the United States, there's more than 200 born in Nigeria. So looking at where the world is headed, and then demographically, as you know, and I'm sure all the audience knows, the vast majority of everyone that was not born in the United States, 85% had come from Europe or Canada. You're, Today, Mike, you're jumping, you're jumping you're in jump the United States that were born in a Africa than born in Europe. Let's so, Let's step There's back, for one, Mike. Let's step back for one second because I want to get to that next. I think that's a great point when we transition from global to U.S. But to stay global for a second, right? So the numbers in Africa, sub-Saharan Africa in particular, are staggering. When you put those numbers together with the eight billion plus phones on the planet, right? The people in sub-Saharan Africa, and I've heard you talk about this multiple times, Milk and Global Conferences, so on and so forth, they have a window into the world. As you like to say, they can see when Kim Kardashian is getting on her jet, they can see what's going on. How do you feel the birth rate in Africa coupled with the ability for them to see what's going on in the rest of the world is gonna change global migration patterns and, and patterns around uh, where population shifts? Well, um, that's why today there's more people that were born in Africa and the United States than Europe. If we have an increase of two billion people on this continent, where will they be 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now? At one point, there was 4% mobile penetration in sub-Saharan Africa. Today, there's 80. So you're going to be able to interact. And in Kenya, David, as you know, they started paying people on their phone. The first reaction was they got a 20 or 25 raise. Why? Because the manager or the foreman took a percentage of the money and then turned around and paid the workers. Now the workers got a direct payment digitally. So these parts of the world are not going to develop like we develop here. And so the question is, how are you going to get on product? What can they afford to pay? And when you see people trying to cross the Mediterranean for a better life for their children, in many ways in this country, we could think about the 50 million people that came from Europe in the 1800s, risking their life, no airplanes, risky travel, to come here for a better life for their family. And so I think we've underestimated the movement of people, and we have a significant change that's occurring from the northern hemisphere and the northern part of the world where in almost every single country, the birth rate is well below replacement today, and where the growth of all setting population and new projections now show that the entire world's population might be peaking somewhere between 2050 and 2070. So in Japan, you have almost two people die for everyone that's born every year. So as you think about this, and the last point I would say in demographics is the aging of the world's population. And Mike, so there'll this be is... more people over 65 in China than live in the United States. And just to switch topics there, because when people talk to me 
about the evolution of technology, right? So you could talk about the, the beginning with the Gutenberg printing press. You can get to the, you know, the telegraph, telephone, internet, first, you know, first computer, then internet. You know, now we have artificial intelligence, right? And in every case, the world land-based these technologies is going to destroy work. Now, if you were a person who wrote calligraphy for books, when Gutenberg created his printing press, it probably didn't work out well for you. But for the rest of the world, it created 10 times the number of jobs that it destroyed. When they talk about the destruction of jobs with AI, I pivot very quickly to talking about the aging of population, right? Because if we don't start to automate more, we're not gonna have enough people to fill the jobs that we have going forward. How do you feel aging and artificial intelligence could come together from a workforce management perspective? I think first, David, we, you can't generalize what's going on in the world. In Sub-Sahara Africa today, median age is under 20. Some countries are at 16 or 17. So they don't have a labor issue. In other parts of the world, you have a substantially quickly aging population. And so for them, uh, the opportunity to write software, code, analyze things uh, can maybe be shifted to older populations. There's no reason to retire at 60. No, we want 60 to be in the new 40. We want 80 to be in the new 60. And so I'm hoping that catches I, on, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> I, so I, just wanna, I just want to comment to you. I just have to throw it in that we don't realize that more than 50% of all economic growth in the last 200 years is attributed to public health and medical research. So therefore, if you want to take a life insurance policy out of term policy today, what you might have charged a 55-year-old in the 1950s or 60s, today might be the same for a 72 or 75-year-old. The probability of dying in the next year has dramatically changed. And so this aging of the population doesn't mean the people are biologically the same age from that standpoint. But when you talk about AI and a, and a reduced workforce, you have to figure out what part of the world are you talking about. And the birth rates, if we shift to the United States, are the lowest ever recorded. So we had far more children born 50 years ago than we do today, even though the population is substantially larger. So the US is a major beneficiary of immigration and the fact that hundreds of millions of people, if they could get to the United States, would like to get here. And Mike, let's now pivot and talk about the United States, right? So 1950s, we learned the other day from your research team that was on our Zoom, that that was when the most babies in American history were born. The 1960s, 85%, 85 of the US population was made up of descendants from European descent, uh, European descent and Canada. Latin American immigration is changing that, right? Where do we believe the demographics in the United States are going from your vantage point? At Zeta, we've built a multicultural cloud that is completely focused on individual demographics if marketers want to target them because we believe that that is the future of marketing in the United States. But when you look at it from a demographics perspective, where do you think that is going? Well, obviously, David, you are a true marketer who's now has a- <laughs> Well, I had to do the commercial, right? I mean, if I don't do the Zeta commercial, Mike, the board fires me, so I sort of got to do that. So um, I think in the 1980s, I began to focus on financing every Latin American business I could in the United States. That was the trend. So the majority of our population that was not born here has come from Latin America and Asia. And now the surge from the Middle East and Sub-Saharan Africa. So if you're selling product and you want to interact with people and what is their culture, what are they focused on? You know, if you go to a soccer match, U.S., Mexico, in Southern California, you will find 
a minimum of 80 to 90 percent rooting for Mexico. That does not mean they're not Americans, but this heritage is important to us. And today, if you look at the second largest school district in America, LA system, more than 70 percent of every child is of Latin American ancestry. So the vast majority of everyone under 25 in California is of either Asian or Latin American ancestry. So as you built your business, what is important to them? The other element is the aging of our population. The baby boomers today are increasing. The oldest group is now 77 years old. The youngest group is over 60. They're interested in health care. You're programming sports. Many of the sports networks I financed the average age of people watching is in their 50s today. They're programming them for a 30-year-old because when they look in the mirror, they still see themselves as 30. So, so I I'm, think- So Mike, I'm not the only one who thinks that? I thought I was the no. only one. When I look in the mirror, I think I'm 30. You know, my wife keeps reminding me I'm not, but uh, I'm, I'm surprised to hear there are others. So I think uh, in this country, whether you're a political pollster, that's using Zeta, or someone running for office, or you're a chief marketing officer, first understanding the wealth line and the baby boomers, the greatest wealth ever, how are they gonna spend it? One of the areas is on their health and wellness, their quality of life, who's providing those products to them. We've seen it in many ways. If you look just, for example, at Nestle, and Kraft. At one time, Kraft stock was selling in the 90s. Uh, today, Unilever announced that they're gonna be a health company. The first reaction on the web was, first they give you diabetes with ice cream and chocolate, and then they take care of you, a 360 offering. Well, now, By Nestle, the way, talk, Michael, talk about starting a flywheel, right? Like you kill the people and then you save them. I mean, that's like perfect. Well, what did they do? They sold their chocolate business in the United States. Yep. They divested their, and they started buying vitamin companies and other things. And today, the values between Nestle and Kraft have changed dramatically. So the understanding the market, and I think the capital today of South America is Miami. So if you are from Argentina, Chile, Brazil, and you name it, and the Caribbean, you're at home in Southern Florida. The capital of Central America is Southern California. And the second largest Spanish-speaking population uh, is in Southern California after Mexico City here. So I think it's very important, and they all have phones. You can see the people. Those individuals that left Venezuela to walk through seven countries to get to the United States for a better life, they have phones, they're communicating on their phones. And so having a digital relationship with your customer is more important. And the streaming of video and sports in this country is gonna dramatically change elements where people if they're using Zeta, we'll know who their customer and who's paying attention. Wow, right? you, you earned dinner there, Mike. I mean, that was great. I, like, I don't even have to do my own commercials here. This is great, but, uh, and, and it, it, good news is it has the luxury of truth. But when, <laughs> when you focus on streaming, right, you've got a big pivot, right? So you literally, I mean, you, you helped almost every network build itself, right? As they grew, as they consolidated, as they moved from what was this sort of three channels. Yes, when I was a kid, there were three channels. Uh, then there were very quickly became five. My kids are upset when they have less than 400. But as it moves from what is even connected TV today to what becomes over the top TV, CTV, the true streaming services, you look at companies like Apple and Amazon that arguably and Google have the best balance sheets on the planet. Now all of a sudden, the networks have to bid on sports against them that they just want to show on their proprietary platforms. How do you think streaming changes the world as it relates to communication versus 
you know, where, where cable has been? Well, DirecTV might have known who was watching that sporting event. Yep. The, but the team didn't know. Now, the potential that I am the Pittsburgh Steelers who have fans all over the world, in Las Vegas, when the Pittsburgh played the Raiders last weekend, almost half the people in the stadium were rooting for Pittsburgh. Okay, gave them a chance to go to Vegas, et cetera. So who are these people? Who are my fans? Who's in London that care about my team? And I think the tremendous increase in values of sports teams is partly due to the fact that you're gonna be able to communicate with your fans directly, whether that is to sell them merchandise, memorabilia, tickets, who knows in betting in the future what might bring. And so, but that is what's going on for every consumer product company. Who is my customer? Who cares about me? We launched a year or two ago these courses online so people get jobs and programming in the United States. It was free. We were subsidizing all the students. Little did we know that someone in Nigeria figured out how to hack into our system, got it free, and we discovered we had 5,000 students in Nigeria we didn't know about. But that is what this technology offers. And why does Amazon, why does Apple, why does Facebook, why does Google have such significant valuations? They can communicate directly. And if Microsoft and Activision do combine, the half a billion people on the planet playing video games, and if they're online, Microsoft is going to know who they are. So obviously, if I'm Louis Vuitton, I'd like to know who my customers are. How can I communicate directly? So yes, you talked about companies that have tremendous cash flow, free cash flow, strong balance sheets. But what does technology and AI allow me to do? It allows me with a small company today to figure out who could be my customers. When Terminator 1, the first Terminator movie was released, they used silicon graphics machines. It cost $4 million. <laughs> you can now morph on your cell phone. So therefore, the cost of accessing and the cost of using AI I was at a baseball game as I travel around to raise money for cancer research this last June. And a young AI company, a friend of mine, joined me. He recorded my voice in the booth over a 10-minute period on radio and television. And before I got back to see him, he had replaced my book online, my Faster Cures book, that we had a friend of mine, Grant Reed, with my voice. Small company, low budgets, in five or 10 minutes, completely delivered a new product to the marketplace. So all I'm saying is AI, yes, it's gonna be powerful for Apple and many in the world that have built these things, but going into business, a small company with ideas and a product today, Eight billion people on the planet maybe can hear your ideas, listen to you, see it, and you might be able to figure out who they are and what they're interested in. So dramatic changes and leveling, in my opinion, of the playing field. How, and, and just to pivot one more time, how do you think AI will help the planet from a sustainability perspective, right? Because Listen, you can't have a talk without AI, right? Literally, you just can't, like, I, I'm sure we'll do, we have, we have 80 plus speakers today, including Zeta people. I'm sure every single topic will have AI in it, right? But most of us are thinking about utilizing it for better marketing or better business intelligence or better outcomes as it relates to organizational operations. When you think about it, if you put your sustainability hat on, right, and of course at the Milken Institute, uh, your most important project is the Milken Center for the American Dream, then I know you're doing a few little things in the cancer space, you know, very, very small, obviously, you know, huge. 
Uh, but sustainability is an important component of what you're thinking about at the think tank. What, how do you think AI affects that? Well, it affects dramatic changes in what we do. Can we analyze our usage of electricity? Is there a more effective way? As we move to electric cars, the people working for us, is, it, is there different times of the day? The altering of use of electrical power where there's different costs based on what time in the day it is. Next, what are the admissions? What is occurring? So once you have this data, and once again, I'd like to just revert, David, to the concept of health and medical research being the major driver, but the concept of healthy planet, healthy humans. So we, over the last few years, had a competition, a prize, can you double or triple agricultural output in Sub-Saharan Africa? So we put up a prize. A 1,000 companies from 100 companies competed. We narrowed it to 25. They had a plant in 16. But we're using AI to monitor the amount of water use, fertilizer use, what is the variation in temperature, what is the best time to plant, what is the optimum use of water, how can we regulate water? Running a vertical uh, farm today in an enclosed structure, and you're recirculating the water, okay, and using artificial light, you can use 99% of the land requirements go away. You have more throughput. You can measure the, the nutrients in food. So whether it's studying life-threatening diseases and the data, uh, today, in using a $5,000 machine to do sequencing, is million times faster than what a human being could have done 30 years ago. So a Mike, million uh, times the productivity. So I see this analysis being done for you, the data at this time. But maybe many of the greatest applications will be in this healthy human, healthy planet area, analyzing maximum nutrients, using up the least amount of our forest and land for growing my more effective ways and monitoring that for both an aging population in the northern hemisphere. So Mike, just to summarize as we finish with one minute and 32 seconds left, when we think about marketing in the United States, we've got massively changing demographics. If you think of the evolution of marketing, right, which just, I mean, forget about going back to the Gutenberg printing press yet again. Just think about the beginning of the Texaco TV show where you started to have soap operas. Most people don't realize soap operas were because Procter & Gamble sponsored it for Tide. It was soap. And you would go on, today, targeted, know your customer, understanding the changing demographics in the United States, what is one final piece of advice you would give to marketers with the 52 seconds we have left? I think know who your future customers are going to be. What is important to them? If you were selling residential real estate in California, you started out telling us that your name might have been Smith instead of Steinberg, okay? Well, if you didn't now know I'd be the Sanchez. Smiths and, and you didn't know the Millers and you didn't know the Joneses, you wouldn't have been a successful seller. Yep. Of the top 10 surnames in California today that buy homes, every single one is an Asian or a Latin American surname. There are no Smiths, Millers, or Joneses in the top 10. And so I think understanding how you're going to communicate with them and in the developed world, understanding the needs of the wealthiest part of the population that's aging and what's important to them. Thank you, Michael. Quality of oh. life, length of life, travel, et cetera. So you need to change your focus based on what are the interests of the customer Michael, and of the individual. Oh. As usual, all brilliant uh, thought processes. I always appreciate your time, and your friendship. Thank you for joining us today. I appreciate your friendship also, David. Thank you.